Okay, so we're good to go, I think. Try to pull up these questions real fast for today. Okay, it's so just five questions for us. Um, so this should go a little bit quicker, right, hopefully, uh, than the last couple of them. Um, so obviously we're going to start here. Um, so our first question for this module is, what are the educational experiences of black girls? Um, so just from the reading or from the videos, what did you guys notice? Um, or what did you see in the text? Um, the first thing I noticed when reading the article was that um, they understand the importance of it. And it's a lot less of an academic struggle and a lot more of like a school culture, school conversation struggle that they had um, when it comes to black girls in public education. I, I agree. I think that almost the social and that part overrides the education part. So it's, it almost seems like it's making. Yeah. Um, yeah. One of the things that kind of stuck out to me was just kind of how the um, cultural differences that oftentimes get like perceived differently by white culture and how, you know, um, being like vocal or loud or animated for a black girl, uh, oftentimes gets them labeled as being disruptive or uh, a problem in the classroom. Um, growing up where I did, I, I think I saw a lot of that um, growing up, although I wasn't, I don't think I was keyed in on to it until later in life, but I definitely could see that happening and being a, the case. Okay, so our next question is to explain the school to prison pipeline and how black girls are impacted. So uh, for me, I remember a lot of that from the video, but did you guys see anything else in there or uh, want to discuss that? I was a little confused on that because they talked about it in that video, but so is the premise of that basically related to the criminalization aspect that if they're acting out, they're going straight to prison. Is that kind of what they mean by that? I don't think it's straight to prison. I think it's a little more like involved than that. But yeah, yeah I think about that video and that girl shared her story about, you know, getting taken away in handcuffs for truancy issues. And um, I know in my district, any district I've ever worked in, we have kids that are chronically truant, but we don't manage it in that kind of some more way, but I've worked in largely suburban white school districts. So, you know, I don't, if that were to happen in my districts, I mean, there'd be threats of lawsuits and all kinds of things. So I think when we talk about that school to prison pipeline, we're talking about how at an early age, black girls or other people of color are exposed to or introduced to the criminal uh, and judicial systems uh, where uh, you know, white kids or, or people who are not in poverty, other subgroups might not experience that same kind of reaction. I don't know if you guys saw it the same way as me. What do you guys think? Yeah, I would definitely agree with you, Matthew. That's how I saw it, too. Um, I would also say that our school district, we are very careful about truancy. Like, we would never take kids out in handcuffs. Like, we usually get, like, um, notarized letters that go home, and there's, like, truancy court, but it's never, like, putting our kids, like, into that fear-based tactic, which I think is what is, happens a lot, especially pulling kids out with handcuffs. Um, but, yeah, I think, too, that they definitely um, have – like it's they're predisposed i think because of their skin color that they're going to be introduced to like the penal system and things like that at a much earlier age than like white kids would right i know last year i had a student who was truant over 50 percent, so he actually had to repeat but i know for our district um I mean, there's lots, like you said, lots of letters go home. And then um, I know our police get involved, like our chief of police get involved, but it's more just like he goes in 
he'll go every morning to the house and just say, okay, it's time for school, that type of thing. It's a little bit more of a positive um, interaction. I mean, it's still, I mean, still the police, but it's not like handcuffed or anything. But I know that it's been, it's a lot more of a positive, like, um, environment than being handcuffed <laughs> and everything. Okay, and that kind of kind of um, that kind of leads into that next question. If we're talking about the school to prison pipeline, which is how do schools, how does school discipline, how is that used to criminalize black girls? Uh, and I think that example that was given in the video for this lesson um, is a good example of that. But uh, what other things did we see from the readings or other uh, experiences have we seen? What I really took from the reading was frustrating with that. Um, uh, the protecting black girls, I really, really enjoyed that because it made me think instead of jumping on the kids right away, whether it's the girls or the boys, for yelling out or kind of stuff, it, we have to remember what the situation they're coming from. And I think educators are far too quick to picture them as being discipline problems instead of trying to be empathetic and try to understand the situation, especially if you don't come from that kind of background. Mm -hmm. um, school discipline, it can go either way. If you're empathetic, you're going to see a difference. If, but if you're very straightforward, with so many days, you either drop out of code, X, Y, and Z, and you're, like, you're out of here type of deal, where maybe you just kind of talk with the kids and figure out what's going on. I know I had that situation this morning where my, one of my girls came in, put in a collar in, put in jeans, put out awkward jeans, got some code counseling, and she just starts screaming at me, this is stuff you don't even understand why I'm in jeans, and I'm like, oh, I'm stupid. <laughs> And this jumps my head right away and I them, you're right, I don't understand and I'm sure there's a reason, but it's out of my control, I'm just like, I'm supposed to do it, so I'm kind of getting into counseling. So I was trying not to discipline for myself, and it almost seems like I was like, trying to pass the buck, but there's a time and a place for everything, and I didn't have the time right then, then there to have a 20 minute conversation. And I wanted her to make sure that I was aware that I'm sure something was going on, but we need to go talk to another adult about it right now that can handle the situation. Right. Yeah, yeah, that makes me think of there was a time in my last district that um, we had a student who was moving into the district and she came and she had like a really nice like weave with um, purple highlights in it and um, I don't know, I thought it looked fine, but we have a school policy against dyed hair color in that district. And uh, we had staff members that, you know, sent her down to the office for a dress code issue. And, you know, we got an email later from mom and dad, and they were awesome parents to work with, but they just kind of explained that, you know, she was nervous about coming to a new school district and they got her this really nice uh, weave with the highlights that she wanted as a way to kind of make her excited and make her look forward to coming to school. And um, I just remember, you know, the, and then just asking us if it would be okay if she could have them for a few more weeks until she felt more comfortable in our building. And I just remember being really um, like, yeah, that's a reasonable request, but we had some staff members that had a really hard time with that. Um, and I don't know, it felt like a cultural difference. It also felt like a strict adherence to kind of dress code issues that you know given the circumstance could easily just be looked the other way I and mean, it wasn't a distraction it wasn't a problem in the classroom so i think sometimes those like um black and white rules that we have uh reinforce some of those cultural uh, biases um, that we you know it's easy to be blind to those I agree. Um, I was reading the article earlier today and it was talking about like when creating class rules, you can talk about like, what hairstyles are appropriate. I just was sitting there and I was like, these are conversations we're having. Why? Why is why does it matter? Like if I'm very white, I'm very, very curly, 
puffy hair. So like I totally get you know walking in being 13 not know what to do with my hair and it being like huge. Um and so like I'm tall, I'm like six foot, so like I'd sit in the back simply because I have to. Like I was otherwise so just be like I could never see I never had anybody tell me, oh you can't wear your hair like that. Like and the reality after being in the class is oh because I'm white. And that's frustrating because I don't I don't care how you wear your hair. Like as long as you can pay attention. Right, so good. Like that's ninety five percent of all the other students in my class are like if you're on it, we're good. I don't like it's just I was very frustrated by the article this afternoon when I was reading it. Just because we seem to have carried the culture of African American women or black women are significantly less than literally everybody else and it drives me nuts because they're people like it's common. Why? Why is the thing? Right. Um and the article kind of highlighted all of those pieces of we really have and, and even the way you said the black and white of our, our, our dress codes, literally. Like, you know, certain people can't wear certain things without it looking a certain way. If they're built a certain way. And genetically, people are built a certain way. It's, it's just the way it is. You know, hair is, is a thing. Like, you don't have your hair. You can't do anything with it. And so, I'm, I'm just frustrated. It's all. Also, off on your Sienna, I think a lot of these black and white like rules and like dress codes are talking about it's like trying to adhere to like the normal culture, and so it's like if it goes against the normal culture, like if you're unaware of it or unfamiliar with it, you just don't want to deal with it. You're like, nope, it goes against the normal culture, it goes against what we know, so we'll just kind of say no to it. Yeah, and that kind of leads into the, the our fourth question, which is what are the experiences of black, black girls outside of school? So not just within our school, but what are their kind of responsibilities, uh, expectations? How do we treat them different? Because I, I do think there is a very distinct difference. I mean, white girls at the end of the day still fit into white culture, so it's less of a burden, even though they still deal with gender discrimination. Um, black girls are uniquely... Uh, a minority group, um, you know, racially and then also gender based. So I think they're in a unique position. But how do we, how do we see their roles being different, or what are their experiences like outside of the school day? The sexual assault, assault statistic that was listed in the article shocked me. I would, I mean, like, you know, you think TV exaggerates everything right. until it doesn't. And then you're like, oh wait a second. I don't know how many of you watch like the crime shows, but like that's like that's a thing. Yeah. And I was just sitting here like, oh my gosh. Like these we, they go through this and this is the reality. And to come to school and to continuously dress code violations, be sure to find you don't wear the right thing and your hair is not really how is that us not compounding already what they're getting at home and the reality is what it is. And that is not good because school should be a safe space and it's not. Um, I definitely think um, kind of putting together both the articles on our black males and our black females together because they come from the same general area is that, you know, they go home, parents are working late hours, they might have younger siblings, they might be male, or any cultural, most cultural anything, now they've got younger siblings they have to take care of, and they've got the sexual assault on top of it. I don't want to be in their shoes. I don't want to take them out of their shoes so that they can be safe. That's how I feel. Yeah, I, I think about my own experiences with uh, students or, you know, kids I grew up with. Uh, and yeah, there's a lot of higher expectations put on, I think, black females uh, as far as, you know, they're generally seen more as like caregivers. They're seen as 
uh, having a lot of, I see them as having a lot more responsibilities. They get to be kids less, I think, than most other um, intersections between gender and race. So, you know, that that's heartbreaking because you think about how many times I've messed up or done childish things or done things without thinking and was given opportunities to learn from those experiences. And then that's not really afforded to people of color in the same way, and especially women. So I think it is a tougher deal for girls. I think they have, uh, black girls especially, or, or women of color have a lot of, uh, uh, they, yeah, they don't get those same opportunities like I, I have. Get over here. Like, I'll make a personal connection to it. My cousin's African American, and she'll like, even tell you like she doesn't feel like she fits into either culture. She's like, I don't feel like I'm white, I don't feel like I'm black, so she's kind of know where I really fit in. And I mean, like, granted, my family, like, like half of her family lives in like super white Michigan. Um, but yeah, it's just interesting comparing like my own family's like comments to the articles and being like, yeah, like it is a very different cultural and like life experience than a lot of us have. Well, and going off of both of that and what Matt said, we talked about, they talk about you know, you're all of their extra responsibilities that they have at home, and then, you know, they don't, they're not afforded the, I mean, the safe moments, but it kind of moves us back to those initial questions of what about this, this school to, to, to incarceration pipeline type thing, and, you know, I can only imagine, I don't, I get frustrated when life, in life, so really horrible, and then, you know, I have to work, I have to deal with people, like, they're younger than we are, and so then they go in, and then we get into that concept that was mentioned in the article, that for whatever reason, it seems to be that any loud and abrasive response in the is all of a sudden considered um, violent, and then teachers are like, oh, well, they're being really violent, and so man, yeah, go to the office, and then, you know, that turns into out-of-school suspensions or in-school suspensions, which then turns into truancy issues, which then turns into legal issues and whatever else, and I can only imagine every time they can talk about that school, the parents are around enough to pay attention, and they're getting, or, you know, an out-of-school suspension, it can be just a parent, then it's just really horrible looking cycle thing. Um, I think that's frustrating too because then the education system has a part in the additional responsibility that they have, the reasons that they can't be kids anymore. Um, and I feel like there's a lot just in the black culture, both for boys and girls, there's a whole lot of this is how you need to act, and this is how you should avoid acting because if you act this way, this is what's going to happen. And I think that that's, that's going to be scary for anybody who has to live their life like, oh my god, I'm doing the right thing every step of the moment. Or that I screw up now and I be arrested, or my dad's going to be mad at me, or you know, whatever that leads to. Um, so I guess it's like that same responsibility kind of stick, it's cyclical back in the school concept too. Yeah, I think that's one thing I think too is that the trauma and that kept coming up in the reading and then it came up about conduct and so for leading to our next question um how can educate a great safe space and support black girls in school I don't think that's a good impact for black girls it's just anyone with trauma mm-hmm. um I can say I can see that you know having to raise your five young siblings because mom has to work two other dogs and dogs in jail and your little brothers and sisters are running about on a bike, right? So they have kind of a trauma. It's not, but this is something that I believe a 12 year old should have to deal with myself with going to school and getting taught themselves. So I think a huge part of that is educators getting um, the trauma informed classrooms and training. And we have another training in our school. I can't remember the name of it. Um, but it's about empathy, the empathetic discipline. Um, but I just think it's a question. Oh, that's most of the class, and being more about trauma because I've been on the train. Um, I'm reading more about the different cultures. I really see how that comes into play and how necessary that is to talk to them about instead of just power down on kids to get them better for them. It's really out of what we know, um, not just a lot of 
Yeah, I I would agree. Um, I think uh, specifically like with the class I teach being a pre-engineering class kind of in that STEM field, uh, I know I try really hard to be encouraging and welcoming for not just black girls, but just girls in general, yeah. because it is a, a kind of an underrepresented. I get mostly boys that sign up for my class and uh, there's a big push to try to, you know, break those kind of gender stereotypes. So, you know, when I think about my classroom and how I can be a safe space for, for black girls, I, I trying to remember or try to keep that perspective of that, you know, even though behaviors and things might not match kind of the dominant culture, um, that they are still, you know, middle school age kids, they're 11, 12, 13 years old, and that they're going to make mistakes. And we oftentimes expect the, our kids to be adults or to behave like adults, even though they're not. So just trying to keep that perspective in mind and allow for some grace with our kids, especially when they are struggling. Um, that, you know, that's one of the things I try to do really uh, in my classroom um, for everybody. Oh, I just, uh, you know, I think about too, you know, we always say sometimes with our kids is, you know, you don't even know what they've seen this morning before they go oh, to yeah. school. Um, you know, I think that's a lot of things, you know, I think teaching, you know, we talk about all this, it all comes back to building relationships with these kids and, you know, having that conversation of, hey, you know, what's going on? And just, you know, they might be middle school or younger, but, you know, they might be seeing a very adult thing before they even walk through your door. Um, no matter what gender, uh, race, or whatever. But just, I think it's so. a relationship and an understanding, you know, just the key thing is. <laughs> yeah. I think, too, that so I witnessed this today. It was between another teacher and a black boy. Black, same concept, the same happen with our, our black females as well. But a teacher gets really spun up. And all of a sudden, they turn around and they start like screaming at the child or yelling at the child for whatever the child did wrong. But the child could have been completely wrong but because that teacher spun themselves up and they turned around and just outspun on the child. The child's up and arms, and they're like, uh, hello, no. And I'm like, oh my gosh. So, what should happen today? And it took everything in me not to turn around and correct the adult that was yelling. And I looked at the child and was like, I just need you to stop. Just, just. Just stop. Acknowledge what she said and then stop. And he like looked at me and I was like, just, just stop. And he like stopped because I've built that connection. I've done it with a couple of my girls too. I have learned that the best way to have a conversation with them is everybody needs to chill and then we can go back and have that conversation. Because especially with this particular group of students, you go spun up, they're going to turn around and do the same. Most of the time, they're going to turn around and do the same thing. And I think that's a cultural thing, but that's okay. Because that's, I mean, our job is to teach them, okay, you can be upset. Well, you can do that. Okay, just here are your tools. You can go and sit down and just take a brush. I'm going to go take a couple of big breaths and we're going to come together and have a conversation about what's going on. Because I have seen teachers who don't do that today, and I was like, oh my god, this is going to go off the rails real fast, and that child's going to get in trouble, and that adult's going to be fine. And it, like, it made me angry, but I couldn't, like, what are you supposed to do? Like, so I definitely think giving the resources to the students when they're dealing with other adults, too, is kind of important. Because not every adult is going to take class like this and be like, hmm, maybe I should rethink the way I interact with my children. Right. Yeah, I'm glad you said that. Um, that's kind of, I mentioned earlier that I have a situation with, I've been dealing with a student and um, she's not a black girl, but um, yeah, it's easy. It's hard for people sometimes to step back and say, hey, you know what, let's take emotion out of this and let's talk about it kind of openly and giving yourself and the student a chance to come back to it uh, after some time to reflect before you have a conversation, I think is hugely um, uh, helpful. But I do think sometimes kids have a hard time with that because they are having that emotion. They're having that, we, we talk about overwhelming feelings and um, they want to have an argument. And as a teacher, as the adult, you're supposed to not take that bait. You're supposed to be kind of like, hey, man, you know what? I can tell you're upset. Um, why don't we just take a break for right now? And then we can talk about this when when we have a little bit more time. And then making like an honest 
attempt to having a, a, an open conversation about, hey, you know what, I don't see everything that happens in my room. Maybe I missed something. Can you tell me what you were so upset about? And then, you know, just trying to kind of model that behavior because emotions are fine. It's okay to be upset. It's okay to be angry, frustrated. Um, but we do want our students to be able to manage those things appropriately and taking time to model it, I think is huge. Enough. Yeah, I think, you know, just, I just think even for my kids, I mean, if a kid is worked up because they know they did something wrong, I, I've done before, and I don't think I, it works well for me to say, you know, let's just take a break. I said, I'm not ready to talk either, so let's just yeah. take a break. So let's come back and let's, you know, go get some water. And sometimes they say, just keep your head down, just relax for a second, you know, because I have a couple, you know, students who kind of can't get worked up, sometimes it's hard for them to get down mm -hmm. and relax to the point where they can't verbalize what's going on. And sometimes even, I mean, I might be upset. I mean, I'm just like, you know, I'm just not ready to talk yet, you know. But I think that's important to show that it's okay. You don't have to do everything that second. It's okay to kind of take a break and come back and say, okay, this what, what, what's going on. Yeah. I think the thing that that's comfortable for us is showing the kids that, okay, I have the wrong. Um, here's what I was feeling, here's what I was going through. Mm -hmm. And it's just going to be yelling at me or whatever the situation was. But open up to your own kids, in front of the kids. Oh, yeah. And then asking them, how did you perceive me? Um, you know, a huge part of my relationship with my kids is they can call me out when I'm being a bad <laughs> head. And it's this. Yeah. And I was like, okay, yeah, you know me, yeah, I yeah. am. And I think taking ownership and creating a space where the kids can call you out politely about what's going on with how you're treating them is a huge aspect. Mm -hmm. And I think that really builds that respect in that relationship with the kids. Yeah. Yeah, I think those are all like great tips and, and great things to keep in mind when you're trying to have those interactions because yeah, it's so easy for as an adult to just say, like, I'm the authority, deal with it. Um, and then, you know, you, you create kids that kind of handle situations as adults in a similar way, and that's not what we want. So, um, yeah, I think that's all good stuff for creating that safe environment for not just black girls, but all, all students. So, cool. Anything anybody wants to add? Okay. So I think that's the end of our questions for now. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and stop.